Welcome to probably what's going to be one of the more difficult episodes of Rivals that I'm going to have to do so far here on Gran Turismo 4. We're going to be heading over to Circuit de la Sarth with the chicanes in a kind of a dual requested episode. This is from both uh, Game with 71 and Rhino GT4. We're going to have to take four different, uh, gr essentially Group C race cars of the you know, late 80s to early 90s. From Toy and they are from Toyota. We have the Minolta 88 CV. It's gonna take a while to get to because Nissan is so nope nope nope. This is because Nissan is so large. We have from Nissan the R92 CP, one of the later Group C cars before Group C ended. From Mazda we have the the iconic rotary powered 787B. And to to break from Japan, from over in Germany, from Mercedes Benz, we have the Sauber C9, a car that I had used before, in terms of uh, trying to drive around the Noshkanes track of Lasar in under three minutes, which was very fucking difficult, but I did manage to pull it off. So f this 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 is gonna. Most of this is just going to be more of, uh, you know, me trying to uh, drive around, the, you know, most, you know, I'll still have a sense of me trying to drive around it as fast as possible, but, you know, a lot, there's going to be a lot of, us, of me just trying to, you know, kind of find that uh, nice comfortable balance just to try to get, you know, a more relaxed thing, because, because trying to do this is not, is, you know, can be pr pretty damn difficult because you screw up a little bit and then you're off, so. And so, you know, Super Soft is meant to give me, you know, the most grip and, you know, just try to give me the, a good feel. So, um, so these laps are obviously not going to be perfect because, you know, I'm not particularly the best around this track. But I'm just going to try what I can, you know, get a good lap out of it and then we'll uh, move on to the next car. I'm, I'm only going to do one lap for these cars because, you know, it takes, it takes over three minutes to do this track when you've got the uh, chicanes. Oh, yeah, that's right. This car only has five gears and does just over 230 miles an hour. Gotta ease up of it. All right, go. All right, good. Looking looking all right. That first chicane went went pretty well, I must say. But yeah. But yeah. So basically, for those who don't know, uh, look. Ow. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, for those, like I was saying, for those who don't know, the Le Mans, uh, the Le Mans, Le Mans, not Le Mans, the Le Mans, the S is silent. Ah, oh, shit. The, the Lassar, the, the straightaway known as the Mulsanne Straight, Jesus, I made a stupid decision there. Um, basically for many years, it was just, it was practically just a straight, a, a huge straight line dash. Where cars would, you know, reach blistering speeds and, and just travel tons of, tons of straight line. Uh, basically, though, that could that was that was very likely to cause crashes, and you know, it wasn't it wasn't, a, it wasn't particularly the safest route because you're constantly driving a car well over, in in, in back in the day, well over 200 miles an hour. So, you know, it's 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 fairly difficult, you know, to kind of keep keep cars uh, going all stable and, you know, keep them from, you know, perhaps having something happening to them. So, to, for safety reasons, they added those two chicanes to kind of, to bring the cars back down for a moment so they can, you know, kind of, kind of bring themselves back together and then just, you know, uh, continue onwards. I think that was the idea. I could just be talking a lot of crap. But yeah, basically, it, I think it was around... The a the uh, I'm trying to think when did they add those those chicanes? It's probably during some time in the early nine. I think I want to say early nineties. It could be late eighties though. I I honestly can't remember when those chicanes were added. So so you know. Right, right. So I haven't exactly had the uh, smoothest ride here. So fuck it. Let's just go for another lap. Uh, just get another one done for this car. You know, try to have one where I don't have a couple incidents like I did first time around. 
Again, I kind of like, when it comes to these uh, cars, I kind of like to, when I downshift, I kind of like to keep them in third gear because you go you, you, you go lower than that and then you, you'll just get some wheel spin, so. Alright, so, so far so good and we're, of course, we're ahead of our old time already, which is fine. In fact, it's actually a bit back there. Um, since we're on, you know, just straight away for now, I can actually, you know, take a look back at it. And then it'll make it disappear. Because not not well, because one, it can get distracting if it's close, and two, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't the ghost doesn't technically work properly in uh, in emulation. It's supposed to be, you know, kinda of, you know, it's supposed to look like a ghost, it's not supposed to be entirely solid, but that's that's not emulated properly in PCSX2 for Gran Turismo 4, so it just looks like a so another solid car that you can go through, so and that and that could be very distracting. So, oh, gave it a little bit too much there of uh, spinning in third, but uh, but that was a much better chicane, and you know now we're quite a bit away from our uh, previous time there. So, this is this is kind of what I wanted. I wanted to have you know like a more a more clean result. That was pretty good. Not not the best, but you know, we, we still man we still managed to you know pull away from our previous time. Now I've got an itch on the bottom of my foot, and I can't scratch it right now because I don't want to let go of the controller until I finished. So, you know, maybe you could probably not get away with not breaking there, but I don't want to take the risk of perhaps screwing something up. So I don't. There I can give it just a little bit of second and then bring it back to third. I don't know if that makes it any slower. Probably does, unfortunately, but you know. Again, just just wanna be just wanna be careful with it. Alright. Probably used up a little too much there, but that's fine. Again, I'm just Oh god, I was close. All right, coming up to the final chicane here. All right, and so yeah, not the best, not the best result, but you know, a three minute nine point six is, I still think, pretty good. So that's a, that's a decent benchmark for the other cars to have to beat. So yeah, three minute nine point six six zero. Now let's head back over. I gotta get back to Lumsarth one, and we'll we'll start by going down the field with the uh, Japanese car. So first up, it will, of the Japanese field will be the Toyota 88 CV. Now, anyone who really knows a lot about Gran Turismo knows that, for whatever reason, a not so dominant car in real life is actually probably one of the best cars to use in the game. If you're of course excluding the uh, Formula One cars. Well, I say Formula One cars. There's only one in GT4, the Formula Gran Turismo. Kind of a shame they got. Kind of a shame they got rid of all those really uh, nice, like uh, somewhat resembling like real life Formula One cars of the time uh, from Gran Turismo 3 over in the North American build. Kind of wish they. Kind of wish they didn't get rid of that because that was kind of cool. But alas, it what just. I guess it just wasn't meant to be. So yeah, what am I feeling? So, anyways, what am I feeling from the scene? Not the scene, 88 CV so far. I gotta be honest, this car actually kind of. I feel like it kinda, this car kind of grips better. And this car has six gears rather than five. So there's also that. But yeah, this car honestly feels like it's got a little more gripping power. Like, it feels like it can take corners, you know. Uh, quicker than the uh, C9 could, like, which is again silly because again this car wasn't wasn't a dominant car. The C9 and I I mean the C9 was like 89 right, and the 88 CV was also 89. So these cars would have raced each other at around the same time, and these 
I'm pretty sure in real life the Sauber was the better was definitely the better car. I mean the Sauber won Le Mans for Christ's sakes. Whereas this didn't. We just I don't think this even came fairly close. I mean it wasn't until two years later, in '91, when Mazda became the first uh, m manufacturer to win Le Mans with a 787B, and to date no other no other Japanese manufacturer has done it since. Toyota has come close in recent years, especially last year, with, what is it, is it, was it the TSO 40 or TSO 50, I don't even remember anymore, they were leading the race, and were about set to win, when six minutes left to go, the car just gave up, and they they had to sacrifice their, their uh, win over to last year's winners, Porsche, so they won two, so Porsche ended up winning two years in a row, which is really heartbreaking, because, you know, Toyota was finally on, on route to, you know, getting that illustrious win because they've been trying for so many years to really get it, right? but they just never had that. They just never had luck on their side because, you know, the Toyotas, the, the, the TS, of course, one of the more iconic Toyotas, the TSO 20, better known as the GT1, that was like, seriously, that was, that car was, should have, could have easily whipped the field in 99. But it had ju it just had too many mechanical problems or, or all these other sorts of, or of situations that kind of just killed the car's chances. So whilst they took second, they had a they had a they still were you know behind BMW '99 and then '98 Porsche I believe also won that. But I think that year, but I, th I think in that year, Port no one was going to beat Porsche. So oh damn that was a pretty close time a 309.542 that was extremely close so you know I kind of drive up I guess that you could you could technically say I kind of drive on the same level there's the first lap I think by the way the 321 yeah that's actually no that wasn't the first lap that was something else I don't even remember now um Yes, yeah, so you know those are two fairly close cars, and I must say, I kind of prefer the way the the Minolta drives. It feels like it handles a bit sharper and a bit nicer, so I kind of prefer that. Anyways, so next we've got, of course, is Toyota. Not in a Toyota Nissan. I was already in Toyota. Derp. Or so I'm gonna quickly try to do a thing here. Oh, whoops! Ah, crap! Now I now I backed out back and. Just try to do this as fast as I can, because it speeds up a bit. There we go, R92CP, we did the little color glitch, because now, uh, now ta-da, it's now stealth. Yes, I want to, I want to just put, I just thought I'd show off that little glitch. Uh, basically, if you want to know how to do the glitch, basically all you have to do is highlight a car, and then just, as soon as you press it, just, the moment you press the X button to confirm it, uh, to get to the color screen, just mash the right button as fast as you can. And if you do it fast enough, you'll, uh, be able to get extra color slots, and you'll be able to, uh, if a car, if, if that car has a special color, oh god, that was terrible, then you can, uh, get some, get some, uh, special colors on the cars in arcade mode. Now, this only, of course, this only works with, uh, cars that have special colors, because if you try it on a car that doesn't have any special color all that'll happen is it'll it'll just keep the last color that was on it and then and just have a blank color template that ironically that for whatever reason reads BMW 120 D04 I guess that was like a default for something a, but yeah anyways what do I think of, how do I think the R92 CP is going to drive I honestly think this is going to be the trickiest of the bunch because honestly, the R92, I, if I remember driving it in back when I used to drive this car in Gran Turismo 4 more often, back, you know, when I was really playing it a lot, I re always remember the R92 CP was kind of a pain in the ass to drive. Not, it wasn't, like, terrible or anything, but I felt like the, uh, you know, the, you know, the Minolta, the 88, the 8 CV, and the Sauber C9, they were kind of more, you know, they are kind of more balanced and more strained the r92 cp just kind of felt like it was just waiting to get loose and be, you know be a bit of a pain in the ass i can definitely tell that this car doesn't have the cornering ability 
of the Sauber or the Minolta. I mean, the Sauber, you know, I, I think I still think the Toyota was the better of the of the three so far, but the Sauber was, you know, not that far off of it. And then, but the R ninety two CP, I think, is you know, just not a, just not as good. Yep, you can kind of see it there. Honestly, I don't even think I'm going to do another lap for this one because I, I can't. I, I can already feel this car just isn't is wouldn't would just you know it would just be more difficult for me to get to a 309.5 and 309.68 with the other two cars. It's just this car just you know it does it does it just doesn't feel like the others. It's and plus to be fair, I'm ne I've never particularly been a big fan of the R92 anyways. I've always, when it came for me and Nissan, I always liked the R80, I always liked the R89C more, and then, I, but of course, I like I like the R390 more from the late 90s, but that was always a more interesting uh, car to me, so, you know, not particularly fussed about it, it's just kind of how it is. I must say doing that kind of made gave me a pretty interesting line, I have to say. I'm not going to do a little thing there. I'm just going to keep it to third. <clears throat> but yeah. I imagine the time won't... Well, you know, it'll probably be a couple seconds off, but it probably, I don't think it'll be too bad. Oh, God. I felt like the car was kind of having a weird feeling where the tail just, and just got that little bit loose where it felt like it was kind of turning into the corner without me giving much input for it. I felt, I felt, I kind of felt a bit uh, spooky, I must say. Oh, fucking hell, why did I say spooky? But yeah, it kind of felt a bit off. I'm, maybe that is a better term. Okay, yeah, this isn't going to be the same time, but you know, it's not too far off. Well, that kind of hurt a bit more, but honestly, I would say if you kind of push it, you'd probably get around the same time as maybe the others, but honestly, I just don't like this car as much as the other ones to really care for trying so to. Uh, sorry to anyone who likes the R92 the most out of the others there, but for me, I would I would definitely choose the C9 and the 88 CV over those in a heartbeat. Over that in a heartbeat. Whatever, fuck sakes. I love screwing up words, apparently. Anyways, well, I thought I'd save the per my personal favorite of the car of the four for last. Come on, there we go. The seven eight seven B, and of course this one also has a stealth livery, so we're gonna put that on. I've always particularly loved, loved the seven eight seven B. To me, it just kind of seemed like a car that was really just unique of its time. It was a it was a car that was damn quick, and yet was was kind of different. It wasn't exactly the fastest car of its of its field in ninety one. There were actually there were faster cars that the seven eight seven B was competing with. But the one thing that this car had over the others, which they, the others didn't, was reliability. The seven eight seven B in fact people love to crap on rotary engines. Well the seven eight seven B ran a rotary engine and what they ended up finding out after it finished winning the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1991 was that the 787B's condition was so good that it, it was actually capable of running another 24 hours. Yes. Most cars, when they finish racing 24 hours, they don't even have it. I don't, most of them don't have any, any uh, potential of, you know, getting close to that. But the 787B was so reliable that it could easily run another 24 hours. Now there's one issue I'm, I'm having with so far that I think is going to be a bit of a problem. And again, this comes to the fact that this, like I was saying, this car wasn't as fast as, as other cars during its time. You could see the car is only doing about 216, whereas with all with the three other cars I've been in, they've been able to do around 230. But with the 787B here, it doesn't quite have that. This, but again, this car was the 787B was always more about reliability and you know just just you know kind of keeping itself together than uh, the others. I think really the only one main issue that the 787B had was it was pretty thirsty. The car did not have the best fuel consumption. But again, when the car was so reliable, it didn't really matter that much. It was able to keep, it was able to make all those pit stops and yet keep going because you know wasn't as many issues. That's why it won Le Mans in 91. 
Still, and again, still the only Jap, still the only Japanese manufacturer to win at Le Mans Mazda. Unfortunately, the seven and eight seven B got banned after ninety one because of simply because well the car. I, it, well, I think it was it wasn't more so that the car itself got banned. It was the rotary engine itself got banned, and I think it get it, it just had to, it just came down to the fact that it was just that reliable. I mean. I mean, if anything, what it sh what they should have just done was, it should have, you know, it w it should have been a wake up call to the other manufacturers, be like, be like, hey, make your cars as reliable as us, maybe you'll do fine. But of course, y you obviously don't know for sure. Oh fuck, you obviously don't know for sure if you know it's the case of uh, maybe it's just the end the kind the kind of engine itself, or it was just because Mazda knew what the fuck they were doing. Uh, who knows? There's all these, you know, all these different factors to it. But I must say, you know, the 77B is fairly... handles fairly well. I do like the way it handles. It's very nice. But yeah, this isn't... I don't... this isn't going to be beating that 309, because I think at the... even with, you know, my little bit of scripts, the car just doesn't have the same top end, so, you know, it kind of loses time there. So, you know, technically this did the slowest, but, you know, I would still choose this over the, uh, over the likes of the R92 CP, and I would probably even choose it over the likes of the, uh, Sauber C9. I've always just been more partial to the, uh, 787B, just to kind of prefer the way it drives. But if I were to choose any of these, personally, uh, the, the one that gave me the best feel to drive is, has to be the 88 CV. That car just handles so nicely, it's very quick, and it's just crazy to think that a car that wasn't that that wasn't that successful in real life is very successful in this game so it wins out for time and it wins out for how I think of it to drive it's kind of kind of a weird episode uh, but we will be taking a look again at the R92 CP against another car in the next episode so stay tuned for that and as always guys if you want to check out my links down below you can do so I've got links for my Twitter if you want to follow my twitch if you want to follow my patreon if you want to donate to the channel my forum boards if you want to join and you know kind of make that forum board actually you know not dead or uh, the highlight reel submission clips where if you want to submit clips for that definitely I definitely would encourage you but if not I still regardless as I always say thank you guys so much for watching and take care and man have I been a bit stumbly with my words today I only start just did this video shortly after waking up so that probably has a lot to explain with it oops thanks again for watching